It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Yeah, baby. This week's starring special guest stars, Mr. Bobby Borg and Mr. Michael Ames. <laughs> and there I am, and me too. And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. <laughs> um, well, they're not real. <laughs> Okay, there we have every. Hey, Bria, can you pan the camera a little bit? I'm slightly out of the shot, so. Yeah, we can move over. I've got a little bit of. No, that's okay. Uh, pan it towards me a, a smidge. And it's. Keep going, keep going. There you go, right there. Perfect. Thank you. Anyway, yeah, we, we've moved into the big time today. Instead of having the uh, webcam mounted, I keep looking over at my computer because nine years of looking at it, but we have the <laughs> camera mounted out there. Um, with a uh, a little like bobblehead on top of the camera to exactly. remind us to look over yeah. there, but he's tenuously mounted at best. <laughs> he's up there with a piece of uh, blue masking tape rolled up like a donut. <laughs> so I'm excited to have these guys back. Both of them are very longtime friend of mine, friends of mine, and uh, as you've noticed, if you've ever seen them on one of our episodes, Taxi TV, before, these guys are really smart. <clears throat> And pretty articulate as well. <laughs> There's literally not a subject you can't throw at these gents without them getting it right every time. Uh, say a quick hello. Oh, man, there's too many people in the room, and it's going by so fast. Gloria Covington, Dave Barrett, Dan Weber, Linda Cullum, Jay Williams, Square Business Entertainment, Paul House, Jesse Peck, Amucci, I think, uh, Bridget Nicolini, Higher Self, Dan Weber, Josie Day, Carl Warsbach, Seth Littlefield. Hello, one and all. Awesome. Um, so, Bobby sent me an email I don't know, a couple weeks ago, and he said, mm -hmm. hey, uh, time to come back on the show. And I said, yeah, actually, that would be great. So we scheduled the thing, and then he said, can we do a thing on out-of-the-box placements? And I thought, wow, somebody sells software in a box that automatically gets you placements. <laughs> How cool is that? Wouldn't that be awesome? You could sell that for a buck yes, right. 99, everybody would buy the a new copy. new tech wave. So uh, I said, what do you mean? So give us a, a little description as to, you know, don't go down the list of sure, what they are, sure. but tell us in general what an out-of-the-box placement is. Okay, well, um, first of all, I, I do a lot of teaching. I teach at UCLA and I teach at Musicians Institute and I speak at Berkeley. And while I'm, when I'm there, there's a lot of students that are asking about getting their music out there, placing their music. And usually the first thing that they say is, how can I get a publishing deal? And they're usually referring <laughs> to the big companies, you know. And, you know, those take, those don't grow on trees and, and those take a little while to build up to those kind of positions and those kind of deals. So, you know, I ended up talking a lot about what they can do in the meantime to actually start building their experience and getting some sync placements that were sort of more realistically based. So did they want to get like, let's say a Warner Chapel pub deal? for the purpose of ultimately getting sync placements or pitching their stuff to artists on labels or generally across the board across any the board. way they could? Yeah, okay. across the board. Um, a lot of the, you know, getting, you know, uh, film and television and game placements. And then in some particular cases, you know, uh, maybe it landing, maybe potentially them a record deal because of the clout that they have from the publishing company. And then in some cases, uh, you know, maybe getting some co-writes and just having the support of the of the publishing company, you know, overall. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you Does know, that still you know, exist publishers that support. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Some of them. Yes. Get, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this whole we idea know of just one. <laughs> it's more, a lot more than one. Yeah. This whole idea kind of came across where, you know, OK, so then what what can we do in the meantime to kind of get you some experience and get out there more realistically? So I came up with this list and I kind of was taking note of a lot of really cool examples that happened over the years that, you know, we're going to pass on to you guys. And some of them are are very basic and you're like, oh, yeah, you know. But these things work, you know, and they and they and they take you to that next level, and they kind of get you sort of, you know, get the ball rolling, so to speak. So I've got to say, when I looked at the stuff you sent me, I was impressed. Look, I, I'm in the trenches on a daily basis, but some of it is just it's like staring you in the face, but you don't see it because mm -hmm. it's you just don't see it. Right. So exactly. I'm really yeah. glad that you suggested this topic. And you know, cool. I, I forgot to do your bios at the top of the show. Yes. So while we're still early in the show, and Bria, can you go make it a little cooler, please? Um, 
while we're in the early stages of the show, I want to read the bio so that people who are watching the archive later know who you are. So next to me is Mr. Bobby Borg. He's a former major label, independent, and DIY recording slash touring artist with over 25 years of experience. That's got to be like 125 years. <laughs> He's been around for a while. Feels yet, that way, I'll tell you. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby, both these guys have done so much in their careers. Bobby's a graduate of Berkeley College of Music with a BA in professional music and a UCLA extension and UCLA extension with a certificate in marketing management and project management. And he serves as a music business educator at Musicians Institute in Hollywood and at the University of Los Angeles in California. That's UCLA. There's the camera, UCLA. <laughs> um, and he also, uh, where we go, also arranges educational programs with institutions overseas. As a music business and A&R consultant uh, to managers, labels, and supervisors, Borg is also, he is also a prominent guest speaker at music industry events and a regular contributor to international music business publications as well. He's the author of Billboard Books bestseller, The Musician's Handbook, Business Basics for Musicians, and Music Marketing for the DIY Musician. Bobby was also elected Vice President of Special Events for the American Marketing Association of Los Angeles and was awarded Volunteer of the that. Year. And these two guys were mm. two out of five authors on a book that we've actually featured on the show before. Oh, yeah. What's yeah. the name of that book? Five, five Star Music Makeover. <laughs> we should have done it in, in stereo. Sorry. Absolutely. Five Star <laughs> Music Makeover. And believe it or not, I generally read the books that we talk about before the show, and I read theirs. And I, I got to admit, I said five authors, I don't know. Nobody's gonna be able to get deep enough on any particular subject. This probably won't be that good. I was shocked at how good it was. Awesome. It, it was yeah, cool. e extremely yeah. thorough. And I mean, I know what you guys are capable of and, and I really didn't think that you would have enough space splitting it yeah. the pie five ways, but I was very impressed. So buy cool. that book if you don't have it. Awesome. And um, sitting next to Bobby is Mr. Michael Ames. He's the founder and president of LA-based independent music publisher, Penn Music Group. Penn specializes in both worldwide publishing admin and pitching music to film and TV and ads. Penn currently represents both well-known songs and artists, um, including I've Had the Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing, Hotel California, um, Olivia Newton-John, our longtime writer, producer, um, John Farrar, as well as rising songwriters and artists such as Todd Wright, Shy Boy, Holly Con Conlon, um, Liz Wright, and many others. Penn's songs have been recorded by artists such as Christina Aguilera, Aloe Black, Luther Vandross, Kenny Rogers, Katie Lang, Black Eyed Peas, um, Kenny Rogers again. So Kenny has two songs that he's recorded. <laughs> Etta James, Frank Sinatra. It is true, but he shouldn't have been listed <laughs> twice, so my bad. Um, <laughs> It is one of those, buy me, do you do admin on Buy Me a Rose? I do indeed. That's yeah. why Buy Me a Rose got its start at a taxi road ride. Discovered a taxi. Yeah, sure. by Rex wow. Benson. And yeah. it was called Little Things back then. And Good I think memory. That, yeah. yeah. And those, Rex was on a panel. And after the panel, the guys who wrote the song came up to me very sheepishly. They're very sweet guys. And I think it was like the second song they ever wrote. Um, they did it on eight tracks of ADAT in a farmhouse with cows mooing outside. And they came up and they said, would it be okay if we went and talked to that publisher who was on the panel? Because uh, I, I think Rex had heard it on the panel. And he said, that song will get cut someday. That song yeah. can be a I hit. wasn't there, but that's, I think, how the story has been relayed. Yeah, yeah well, I was there, and I just make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the biggest fish I ever caught. <laughs> now, this actually happened like I'm describing it. And ultimately, Rex published it and uh, got it to Kenny Rogers. And I think Kenny's favorite, or who, I think it was Kenny's manager, said, Rex, why have you never pitched me this before when he had already sent it to him like seven previous times? Yeah. So and, and it went on to be a number one for Kenny Rogers, his first yeah. number one in like twenty years or something, and then Luther cut it and had a top ten with it. Yeah, I think. And uh, yeah, I forget the exact chart position, but it's but it's amazing. I mean, in a testament to Rex's dedication, because he was yeah. like. I know that this can cross over and be from one genre to another, and damn it, I'm going to find the outlet for it. And Absolutely. Luther Vandross, I mean, you can't think of it. Come on. Yeah. You know. And Luther's version was every bit as good in its own right yeah, as totally. Kenny's version. Totally. Um, so prior to Penn, Michael is a trained songwriter composer from Cornell University and worked with Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Wow. And worked on the catalogs of Jimi Hendrix. Are you old enough to have done this stuff? Well, he didn't. Shh. you didn't work with Jimi at 
when he's still alive. It's the salt and pepper. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Michael's like, right. <laughs> I'm not that old. He was a well-established <laughs> publisher when Jimi Hendrix picked up his first guitar. I'm old, but not that old. Uh, is currently, uh, yes, right. Are you currently the National President's Association of Independent Music Publishers? I actually ended on December 31st, but I was president for four years. So are you like President Emeritus now or whatever uh, they call Yeah, that? I guess I'm officially past president. There you what, go. what I'm called, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm really, really glad to have you guys here. So now yeah, thanks back to uh, the topic of out of the box. So they've actually, they're going to be teaching a course Um uh, they're going to be teaching. Oh, yeah. a, 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 <laughs> it's an online course. Um, oh. It's an it's an online course. So you, you know, any of you could be taking it from any part of the world it's because called, you're experienced in yeah. online. Ex yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You've got chops. Right. It's uh, it's called Intro to Music Publishing: A Creative and Business Perspective, and it's held at UCLA Extension. So if anybody's interested, you go to uclaextension.edu and you you know search for my name and Michael's name. Uh, name. B o r g and, uh, and Ames is actually spelled E a m e s. Everybody mispronounces it. His own mother calls him Michael Ames. But it's actually, it's actually Michael Ames. Right, right, right. Well, and this has been Bobby's class for, what, 10, 10 years? Uh, it started in like 2003. That? Yeah. So a long time. Oh, all right, even yeah. longer. Yeah. So, And he was kind enough to bring me into it last year. And it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, we're partnering, partnering on the class, so it's going to be it's going to be great. Yeah. And if you guys want to sign up, there's still time. It starts next Monday. So Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the topics is this out of the box music placement mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, do you want to just yeah, let's go just, down your list and you guys go back yeah, and forth, and I'll do my nails? Yeah, let, let, <laughs> let's fire away. So we we have about let's see one two three four we have about eight that we're gonna talk to you guys about um, spinning film festivals, acting reels, MMA fights, wedding videos, co-writes, YouTube stars local businesses that's kind of the outline we're going to touch on each one of these they're all opportunities for you guys to get placements and michael and i are going to go back and forth on these and because he has a client that actually he signed as a result of the spinning uh -huh. class i'm going to let you oh, take right. the first one so uh sure so you, you were actually in a spinning class <laughs> I, I mean, the, are you more shocked that I just did exercise? Is that what the idea is? <laughs> no, I'm shocked that you've got the time. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is a big spinning person. So, so you went to pick her up. I, I even went yesterday, and I'm going tomorrow even. Wow. To pick her up. No. Oh, you got I'm to the, actually okay. in the class. Awesome, awesome, I picked awesome. her up too. Oh, okay, good, good. No, good. but but where um, what Bobby's referring to in particular is um, – you know, my wife, who's a big spinning person, you know, has kind of been enmeshed in that whole sort of culture. And there was one time where she was like, oh, hey, you know, I was watching this video that I got turned into, turned on to while I was in my spinning class. And what's that thing again that you can find out like what a song is? And I was like, yeah, that's Shazam. <laughs> so she was like, let me bring up the video, you know, that we had in class. And she starts playing it. And and I shazammed it, and it was this guy, Mikey Wax, who's based, well, he was based out of New York, now he's based in LA. Uh, but it was just, like as Bobby said, I literally, she was like, man, I love this song, you know, I wonder what his deal is. So I was, you know, being one where I was like, this is my job, to like find out what's <laughs> happening with somebody. I did my investigation, and I totally, through Kismet, I happened to be going to New York two weeks later, he happened to be having his CD release party while I was there. So I reached out to his manager and was like, hey, this is me, this is how I found out about Mikey, could I come to the show? And checked out the show and it he was fantastic, everyone's singing along to his songs and I was kind of like, all right, this is a good sign. And so we just started a conversation that wouldn't have gotten anywhere had it not been without the spinning class. You know, so I mean, a lot of, I don't know how many spinning classes either of you have been at. <laughs> I oh, watched man, one on morning. TV <laughs> I watched Seven a, pe a Peloton commercial. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven you know, but I mean, you know, music is a central part of yeah. spinning. So whether it's a national chain or, a, you know, smaller, I think they're probably more smaller, you know, local spinning classes. All the spinning instructors, they all need a playlist. They all need music. Mm -hmm. You can reach out to them. You know, find out you know so what, they, where they're pulling their music from. Check out my stuff. You know, and then it can all just and do go they viral license it? I mean, do, my wife. When I met my wife, she was teaching aerobics six days a week. Right. And she would just bring a cassette player with her, which was Taxi's first 
cassette player that we used to screen music, coincidentally. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, she didn't license music from anybody. She would just take Madonna songs, put them on a cassette, and bring them into class. Well, you're, you're getting into a whole other topic that we can okay, cover at another then, time. Right. But, yeah. but in, th- <clears throat> in theory, with the performance license and just like a, you know, a normal spinning thing, they'd probably be okay. But since you mentioned Peloton, there's whole craziness going on with Peloton. Right oh, now. I, I can imagine because you know because there's a, a lawsuit or... that was just filed. We're waiting to see what happens with it. And... Well, that makes sense because yeah, they're sending music uh, down a wire exactly. uh, to people all over the world simultaneously and exactly. not at ran- not random. You know, yeah, it's on a playlist. So yeah, yeah. I'll, but yeah, yeah, that's another show. But that, um, another going show. back going back to your wife going to a local spin class. So the person teaching the class is the person who puts together the playlist. Mm-hmm. Correct. And how do they compensate the songwriters? Because that's what we're here talking about. Well, if, if I could jump in at this point right yeah. now, I mean, I would say that, you know, in the early stages of your career, you know, sometimes it's, it's important, you know, what you uh, learn and not necessarily what you earn. So if you're of that philosophy and, and you want to, you know, get the experience and maybe the exposure and get a guy like Michael to hear your stuff, which is exactly what happened in your client's mm-hmm. particular situation, then, you know, getting yourself out there in these ways makes a lot of sense. You know, of course, at some point you have to draw the line because at some point you have to start making money. But myself as a musician, you know, I worked for free a lot to build up my experience. So I was also the philosophy. It's not always what you earn. It's what you learn. So and it worked out well for you. It worked out well. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so, uh, so moving on, shall we move to the next one? Or absolutely. Well, okay. why don't you, since you pin, you pinned on me, tell my story. Why don't you tell your local business story? Well, oh, you want to go around. to this one now? Yeah. Why not? I'm ready to jump around. I keep you. Okay. On your t- or your MMA story. Oh, you want to hear the MMA? Which one do you I, want? I MMA. <laughs> All right, we'll that? do the MMA story. So <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> so MMA, obviously mixed martial arts. So you might wonder, how is that an opportunity? So we are in California where running into celebrities and running into people maybe are a little bit more common than if you were in Topeka, Kansas. So I I will admit that. However, I had a friend that was working out at Gold's Gym in Venice uh, Beach, California, and happened to spot an MMA fighter. And what's interesting about this story is how he was thinking, you know, he was thinking one step ahead and he said, wow, so what do MMA fighters do? They fight, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Where do they fight? Well, they usually fight, in, you know, in big competitions. The competitions are usually aired on what? You know, Fox Sports, ESPN, right. etc. So he said, what do they do when they're announced? They usually walk out of the stadium and they walk out, you know, with usually very dramatic music, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm going to ask that guy if he wants me to write his own customized theme song. So when he enters into the studio, into the uh, venue, it's going to be my music, which will then be heard by other Fox Mm -hmm. sports people and ESPN people, et cetera. And... And, um, and of course, I'll also get, you know, royalties and performance royalties in the back end down the line. Mm-hmm. So he approached them and the guy was ecstatic and thought it was the most amazing idea and brought him into a studio and they composed something specifically for him and, and bam. And that led to more, uh, you know, Fox Sports um, uh, licensing opportunities and, uh, and just, you know, keeps on snowballing from there. So I thought that was a cool example because who would ever think, you know, in that kind of connect the dots way, you know, kind of forecasting into the future where it could go. So again, we are in California and running into an MMA fighter is probably more possible here than it might be somewhere else. But the thinking behind the story, I think, is cool. Running into lots of things here in California. Well, I, I was going to say, we, we are the porn capital of the world. <laughs> oh, and I'm not going oh, to oh, go too far down that you know, road. You went there. Uh, we, we don't have that one on our yeah, list. exactly. It's on my list. <laughs> but, you know... You could apply the same logic. Actually, it could. I, yeah. I've got to say, for those of you who don't know, Taxi started in an apartment building 27 years ago, and two doors away from us was a famous porn star in one of the apartments. Hmm. And none of us ever talked to her, uh, but she would, you know, like take her garbage out and then go get her mail, and we would all see her. And guys on the staff would go, "She's a famous porn star." We'd think, I don't know, because I don't watch porn. But okay, <laughs> I take your word for it. You could apply. Well, I don't. You could, yeah. Sure. I mean, Why you not? Could, if you're a big enough, porn, if you're Stormy Daniels, you could have your own Stormy 
Storm, you know, not stormy, stormy Monday. Stormy song. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. You could have, you, you, or, Any, anyway, so thinking out of the yeah. box. Anyway. Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to steal the... <laughs> <laughs> if you live in Charlotte, you could run into a NASCAR driver in a grocery store. Absolutely, yeah. That's totally true. Keep, you, keep on, you can keep on going with that, definitely, okay. yep. All right. Well, let's see. Going down our list, uh, I'll pick film festivals. All right. <laughs> All right. And I've got something to add to that I'll as well. Film so. festivals for right. five. We're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they, they do it's to let you know which one's the daily double. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, again, I think a lot of this as we're talking through all of these. I think that's kind of different is you these are things that are kind of in your face and maybe seem obvious but you don't necessarily think about them until something triggers it you know like so yes we're in LA but i mean honestly i feel like all over the country there's film festivals going on mm-hmm. at any time of year right i mean even just i'm trying to think california alone we, i know we've got LA we got palm springs Santa Barbara, Barbara, film festival, know, yeah yeah you know yeah. i mean it's like lots Silver lots Lake of film, film festivals yeah. and you know who's at film festivals but filmmakers mm-hmm. and actors mm-hmm. and you know so much of the film festival scene are independent films they're not hugely well financed and have studios behind them but the thing that is why I have always focused on sync is that everything needs music. Mm-hmm. No matter how small or seemingly insignificant up to like a really important scene or the themes, these things we're talking about. And, you know, any of these film festivals, however big a festival, small a festival, it is just ripe for, you know, schmoozing. You know, I mean, even take like I know ASCAP in particular does their Sundance Cafe, and yes, mm-hmm. in the sun in the film festival world, the Sundance Film Festival is probably the pinnacle, right? But right. It, you can't you probably know, get in or get a ticket at any price. That's a whole separate thing. Yeah, yeah go totally. to the Peoria Film Festival. You know, but there I mean, you can get a ticket. ASCAP has always sponsored the Sundance Cafe, where they fly artists in and then they they perform all day throughout the festival, and they're bringing in fil- in uh, filmmakers. I've heard of some artists that, you know, when they get sufficiently networked in at any film festival, you're going to have tons of parties. Parties will need entertainment. You know, it's it's all a matter of how can I be in a group of people who need potentially what I do and expose yourself to them. So whether it's walking around with, I guess these days, USB sticks and as opposed to CDs, you know, saying this is who I am, watch a film, you find out who the filmmakers are, go up and talk to them. You know, anyone in that world is going to love to talk about their art. So if you can engage on that artistic level of, and, you know, I loved how you use that song in this scene, yes. and the next project you do, I would love to be involved. Here's what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, kind and, of and it's so it works so much better to ask them about their world than walk in going, "Hey, I'm Michael Lasko, and I do music, and you should put it in your next film." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Walk up and say, you know, I was really touched. I watched your film, you know, last night screening, and I loved how you did this or that. And how did you get started? Everybody loves to tell their life story, and when they're done they're going to say how about you you know oh you have such a great sense of how music can fit into a scene how what's your background how did you how did you get to that point are you a musician yourself yeah exactly (laughs) they all love that right you know so depending on what the situation is you can take it in a bunch of different absolutely yeah and to add to that you know i once heard a quote from a, a, a director he said i'm not in the music business i'm in the film business and film people hang out at film festivals right? yeah so i told my my students this um and and this one particular group by the name of Mayfair that were an independent rock group they said heck let's throw our stuffs in the in the van let's drive up to Sundance they actually just picked um, you know a hotel where everybody is partying afterwards they didn't even have you know uh, you know entrance into the into the events they mm-hmm. just set up in a in in a lobby of, of a hotel and just started jamming you know acoustic guitars bongos singing yep. and believe it or not Somebody came up to them and said, you guys are really, really cool. We're, we're having a party up on the roof later on. Can you guys play there? Hmm. They ended up playing there. And long story short, they ended up in a major motion picture film. And this student was very happy and proud to invite me to the uh, ceremony, oh, that's awesome. red carpet ceremony where they had champagne. And the director was talking about the... Uh, the film and you know they they got their music into a huge film i mean that's, wow. a, it's a, that's it's a cool awesome. it's a cool story when you see things materialize like that totally. just by hanging out and being there and just doing what you do and people will take notice so i can see people buying wetsuits right now 
Why? Because the Cannes Film Festival, they have these giant super yachts parked all up and down, whatever. <laughs> that the, is true. The, the people, you know, <laughs> wetsuit with uh, like suction cups climbing up the side <laughs> of the boat and then start singing. <laughs> nice, nice. That, that might be a little over the top, but, but I agree with the idea. But, you know, I also am somewhat appalled sometimes. You go to like an yeah. Eric Clapton concert and there will be every time you go to some major concert there's somebody sitting out in front of the ticket windows playing Eric Just Clapton playing, songs yeah, on acoustic yeah, guitar yeah, yeah. do they think that like Eric Clapton's going to come out and go wow you're doing that better than I am can I, can I <laughs> sign you to my label right, 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 yeah. I always feel bad for those guys anyway yeah I mean there's a point where you know uh, being you know you know, you can be too pushy. You know, I, I, I suppose you just have to be, you have to read the situation right. You have to know when to back off, you know. You just have to be very socially aware and, and, and know when you're bothering people and know when yeah. you're not, you know. And I think what they did is they and they waited around until people were drunk enough not to care. <laughs> <laughs> and they, then they started playing. Be cool until people notice you. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. then be courteous and genuine and authentic and all that stuff versus, hey... Yeah, nobody I mean, likes. Hey, I make the best music in the world. No, you yeah. don't. <laughs> You're repulsive. I mean, totally, totally agree. Nine times out of ten, everyone who comes up to me and does the, "Hey, I'm fantastic." Yeah, really not that fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, definitely a value would be reading books on you know social IQ and and you know interpersonal <laughs> communication and things like that. I mean, really, I mean that stuff would be really really helpful for the networking part. You oh, know? for sure. Um, all right. Well, so uh, yeah, let's next? see. Um, Local businesses, I'll, I'll throw that one out. When I was going to uh, uh, Berkeley College of Music in Boston, um, there was a, a, a liquor store in Kenmore Square called Circle Liquors. And, uh, you know, it's frequented by lots of college students, you know. So <laughs> we um, had access to the studios at, uh, at Berkeley, and we thought, let's just go ahead and write a jingle for Circle Liquors. Because Circle Liquors was a small, you know, family-owned liquor store in the area. And they did their own advertisements on, okay. on WBCN or BCN radio. So we figured, well, they advertise, you know, we're musicians. <laughs> Let's just go <laughs> ahead and write a jingle and bring it to them and just say, hey, you know, we recorded a jingle for you. And what do you think? And do you like it? And th we brought it to them and they absolutely loved it. And they asked if they can use it in their next advertisement. And, you know, we weren't worried about, the, again, you know, the licensing issues because we were just about, like, er, you know, learning first Free before liquor. earning. <laughs> right. Let's yeah, I could throw in a couple, <laughs> throw in a couple six packs. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was that simple. I mean, we found the local business that was in charge of its own advertising and we wrote a jingle for them. They liked it. And boom, you know, we were now, you know, certifiably experienced music mm -hmm. publishers, essentially, right? We got our stuff in yeah. so and then from there you build confidence and you build a little bit of a resume and, uh, and you've got you know, an you example you can play for other I wouldn't go to another car dealership in the same location because they're competitive but now you could go to you know like a, a five and dime or you know, nobody calls them that anymore but you know what I'm saying sure you could, yeah. you could just take that same thing and, say, and go elsewhere yeah Absolutely. I'd love to do one for you guys we won't exactly. use the same we did vocalist. a great job for these guys over here we'd love to do the same for yeah. you yeah. now keep in mind I mean these are out of the box things and they are they are steps they might be to some of you baby steps and it's important to like be to be willing to take those baby steps because the problem is is a lot of people always just want to hurry up and make it and my father had a great saying he said sometimes the long way is the short way which basically means while everybody is trying to find you know the the shortcut to the top you just work your butt off and the next thing you know you're there and everybody is still trying to hustle and figure out how to break in so sometimes you just have to roll up your sleeves and you just have to go for it yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you know, it, do you want me to pick or what well, do you, what do you want before me to you do? do I, I want to underscore um, Bobby's point on that. Yeah. We have a taxi member named Sherry Marcus, Sherry Milano Marcus, Sherry Marcus Milano. Anyway, Sherry, um, you know, she she's a grown up. Um, I don't know if she's a senior citizen yet, but she, she's she's one of these people that's always looked for multiple streams of income. I think she's got a good business head. She's articulate. She's smart. She sees an opening and she goes for it. Well, she did exactly that with local car dealerships and local businesses, wow. and she turned that into a nice living, uh, hmm. I think, in the Philadelphia area. Oh, so cool for it, her. it absolutely can be done. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really awesome. Um, cool. Good. All right, I'll like throw a, p a pin down, and 
I'll take wedding videos for 500. Yeah, because you know the thing pretty much. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know the person that did it. Right? Uh, well, much. yeah. So, and it actually kind of, it's an easy one for me to pick because it ties in to the spinning one earlier okay. of uh, this guy, Mikey Wax, where, you know, where he and his manager have built this great sort of following i'd say with these out of the box placements and other th other ways in which someone can start from nothing and build um but again it made perfect sense to me when I, once i heard it but it was like getting into the whole wedding video and photography market like mm -hmm. Every single city is its own market. They have videographers. They've got professional photographers, all of whom are constantly being hired, you know, at all of these sort of venues. And particularly the videographers, they're doing montage videos at the end, you know, when they're all done with the wedding, they're editing everything together. Mm -hmm. If you have like the most amazing wedding, I love you, honey song ever, like you should be getting these wedding videographers and photographers servicing the music because, you know, I opened my eyes to apparently there's like huge conferences that happen oh, no, I think, in crazy. Vegas. Yeah. Of, yeah. That I, had, wedding I mean, videos. again, it makes sense that it existed, but it was never in my world. Mm -hmm. Of just like, you know, you get someone who's a popular videographer or photographer, and if they really love your song, you know, you can end up being sh getting shown in multiple wedding montage videos mm -hmm. after the fact. You That's can typically idea. get a credit at the end, you know, too. You know, and, and how many people are either maybe putting their wedding videos up online, or they're certainly sending it around to friends and family, and all of a sudden, you didn't even have to play at the wedding, yet you yeah. have like the entire wedding party getting exposed to your song and, oh wow, I love that song. Let and hopefully all that. the bridesmaids and aren't married yet so that they hear it and <laughs> want to use it for the, you know, I mean, literally, right, right, it could right, be right, right. viral it's like, it's to snowball. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's all about just like, you know, and hey, if you could even, and who knows, getting hired then from that to play at a wedding might even happen. Yeah. Right. Like, who knows? But right. I mean, it's, it's some of these things of, no matter, I think, I think where we want to stress with these out of the box things is that it, you don't have to just be in like the music cities of LA, New York, and Nashville to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. Whatever your local market is, yeah. everyone is getting married. Everyone needs to, you know, do some of these other things. Everyone, not necessarily everyone, but they got spinning gyms all over the country. Mm -hmm. Like there's lots of different ways in which just think about like who would use your music that in just your local community and I've take got advantage one for of you. high school football teams that don't have a theme for when the wow yeah when that's the awesome. team runs on the sure. field there you go that's cool yeah and, and sure. if i were going to pursue that i'm giving the giving this one away yeah go to the awesome people one. who do yearbooks because uh. they know the people who can open doors for you at every school mm -hmm. so and i once looked at something along those lines that's some ridiculous like 8,000 high schools in America that's a that's a really great if one. you got 10% of those schools wow yeah to each give you a thousand bucks yeah I mean that, no, that that's, that's, that's amazing no, I mean in, in an offshoot really from that too and this is not necessarily a placement but again I was always fascinated by it when I found it is um is it NACA, I think, mm -hmm. National Association of Campus Activities, mm -hmm. yep. of like just this whole network of, they have the regional and national conventions, I guess, and you go and you perform and you get exposed to all these bookers at all of the colleges and universities or whatever, and you can design like a whole tour around these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to the wedding video thing because I've got to share this story. I don't think I've ever told this okay. on the show before. It's hysterical. So somebody, my ex-wife's cousin or somebody got married and they did the reception uh, some family member had a really nice house and they did the reception in the backyard and the videographer set a camera up on a rotating um, tripod where it just sat there and went slowly panned the yard all day long so for some b-roll stuff sure people walking by the camera going Bobby and Susie we're so happy for you uh, well the father of the bride was taking all the checks and cards that his father of the brides are known to do, and he was putting them all in his in, inside pocket of his sport coat. Okay. He hung his sport coat on a fence in the backyard when he went out on the dance floor, and guess what was missing later from the thousands of dollars worth of checks? Oh, my God. 
So everybody was freaking out. Well, guess who actually took the checks? It was the father of the bride was paying himself back. The oh video, the videographer's panning oh video, got video, and, and the videographer called the bride up, and he goes, I don't know how to tell you this, oh but it was your God. father who stole the money. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> the wedding was actually annulled. The marriage was annulled. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, oh. Anyway. Oh, oh wow. Geez. Speaking of out of the box. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, wow. Anyway, there's my contribution. <laughs> nice. nice. Let's see. Oh, we'll do YouTube stars now because a lot of people like that one. So there's a lot of videos, obviously, on YouTube where you have these, you know, these experts teaching people how to put on makeup or, you know, do their hair or that kind of thing. And they have their intro music and they have their outro music and they have their background music while they're talking. Um, you know, would it be so you know, out of this world to say, um, you know, to email that person and say, I love your, you know, your makeup tutorials and I've got some great music. I would love if you're in, ever in need, you know, to, uh, con I would like to contribute my music to your, you know, to your next broadcast or maybe to a couple episodes. Makeup tutorials. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I was kind of like, does Michael know we're on camera? <laughs> I was like, wondering what you were right doing. there. <laughs> I was wondering what you were doing. Um, and you know, these these uh, these 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 stars, these YouTube stars, get you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of hits. And here you are, you know, you know, synced with their with their videos and getting exposure. And then they could put a little thing on the bottom that says it's your music and have maybe a link to your site. And again, it's it's just it's just moving forward moving that needle forward you know and, and 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 getting more exposure and experience so maybe somebody sees it keep in mind a lot of these people are influencers so they have sponsor deals shut up already maybe one of the sponsors says wait that music was really cool we want to end up putting it into our advertisement as well or you know sync it with our brand and some commercial you never know mm -hmm. you know so i know a young husband and wife that are traveling the world and uh I had to guess they've got a half a million subscribers anywhere they're going to do a hundred countries and they're up to like 88 now and, and they use a would this be Winogreski? no <laughs> uh, no it's not <laughs> it is but it's not okay right, 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 right. He's anyway no, they, these too, are right? like late 20 somethings and um, so they started using a library and this library pays a uh, referral commission so in the uh <laughs> comment section down or not comments what's above the info section on youtube it says you know if you want music that w we get it from this library and they make money when somebody else uses that music in their videos hmm. well the, this husband and wife published their quarterly profit and loss statement and their biggest revenue stream is not from the youtube monetization it's from referring people to that music library no kidding yeah wow. and, and they're now making last Quarter. They haven't published this quarter yet, but as of last quarter, they're about 350k a year. What? Tra traveling the world, making three. And the cool part is, all these resorts and cruise ships are like, "Hey, you're an influencer now. Come on my cruise oh, right. ship for a yeah. week for free. Come yeah. down to my resort yeah. in Cancun for a week for free." So it's absolutely viable yeah. that any of these resorts that see their end product, because that's you know, come and stay for free, but put a video of our resort up on your right. thing. Right. Right. Sure. Um, it's totally conceivable that the ad agency making a commercial for that resort or the resort itself may want that music to be a theme playing in the lobby when you you know yeah absolutely all these yeah, different for sure so yeah you're absolutely 100 percent right yeah definitely the more, the more more places you can get yourself you know in front of you know eyeballs and in front of ears uh you, you, why not you know especially yeah. if it fits if it fits your brand of course when everybody else is zigging zag baby. there you go yeah there i mean go. and one of the ones that i've always liked that bobby had on this list and admittedly this is more of an probably an L.A. focused thing, but I had never thought of it before, before we started doing these things together, it is actor reels. You know, like we were talked about some of these other things, but there's a ton of actors in L.A. I'm sure there's a lot of actors Go everywhere Go to any else, restaurant, they'll be waiting on your table. Or driving Uber or Lyft or whatever. Right? Right, but right, there's right. just tons of, of aspiring actors in our community, and every, every actor has a reel, or certainly needs a reel, and you know, look, looking at a reel without music is going to be pretty boring. So, you know, you need to find again whatever say message you're trying to put across. You find the right pe thing, piece of music, whether that means you happen to know actors or there's certainly businesses all around LA that cater to that community of helping to put together this and that. 
you know, it, it's get your music into the place where someone can hear it, where it might fit with what they're doing, and then who the hell knows who's going to hear it? There are going to be just online, know. you know, forums and, and Facebook groups that have uh, aspiring actors. You know, yeah, get, yeah, sure. get in their yeah, network. Absolutely. You don't need to be in their town even. Yeah, no, that's ab- that's actually absolutely true. Because yeah, there's. I guess LA casting and five million other sorts of things where you don't even need to be local and you've got, you know, yeah. you, you can upload it remotely, be wherever you are and still make it seem as if you're local when you're not. Yeah, and again, the cool thing about that is is who is going to look at that actor reel, usually casting agents, and then casting agents are gonna give it to directors and producers, so exactly. they're gonna hear it and so on and so forth. And of course, even the actors and actresses um, that are you know that get that get booked if the music gets used and one tells the other and so on. You just you well, know. and what I found even more and more because um, my son even aspired to be an actor for a couple of years and we we didn't end up doing it. But what a lot of uh, actors are doing now, where it is so hard to get booked on things, so the best thing that you can do is create your own vehicle right. to feature yourself. So you become the producer, the director, and especially if you've used or met someone whose music that you've used maybe in your own reel, you can be like, God, you know, I really loved that thing for this thing that I'm going to be the producer on. I want to, if I don't already know them, I want to meet them. I want to bring them in to write the music for my thing. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, so you're talking yeah. about like actually creating your own project, like your own documentary film and then using your own music in that. Is that what you mean? Well, well potentially if mm-hmm. you're all this, all that same, but saying playing off your actors reels thing mm-hmm. that so many actors now to try to even get work are creating their own work. Oh, I creating see. Right, their right. own projects. Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. For which they're still going to need music. Right, for right, it. right, so, right, right. You know, right. it's like everyone can sort of help each other. Yeah. Well, there or like, um, uh, this also sort of ties, I guess, into our film festival thing. But if any of you guys, if you remember watching the Oscars, the guy Ludwig, and I can't remember his last name, and I probably would horribly pronounce it, but basically he's the guy that wrote the score for Black Panther. Mm-hmm. And when he made his acceptance speech, he was just like, uh, the guy who directed, I think it was Ryan, no, was it Ryan Coogler? Ryan who Coogler. I th- Thank you. Um, who directed Black Panther. They had been roommates at USC. And so in his Oscar speech, he was like, who knew, man, that 10 years ago we would have been doing stuff yeah, in our dorm room, and here we are 10 years later, and I'm accepting an Oscar. There you go. Uh, I saw the Oscars 10, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, Martin Scorsese, the woman who did a score for, I think, I want to say Gangs of New York or something that Scorsese did. Anyway, she got up to accept the Oscar, and she said... We met in film school. So if you don't think that it's a viable path to meet a young filmmaker while you're a young musician and say, I will score your student film, totally. she said, yeah. and here oh, yeah. I am holding an Oscar. In my yeah, head. That, yeah. So I love that. It's yeah. not Same just thing. a one off thing. It yeah. happens. Yeah. You never know. We don't have college film on here because, uh, you know, because it's a lot of people know about this route and I didn't think it was so much out of the box, but that's definitely a, a good one. And to add to that, when I was teaching my uh, UCLA class, we I took them over to the film school and we sat in on a film class. And then afterwards I asked the professor if I can come up and ask the class a question. And I said, how many of you guys out there would be willing to work with a class of musicians that all you know write and compose their own music? And um, you know, would you guys be interested? Do you need music? Would you be interested in working with young artists and songwriters? And all of them raised their hand and they all came down and mingled together and exchanged numbers. So. People are very, very interested in, in this kind of thing. Oddly enough, many universities, not even just big famous ones, but small local universities have a music department and have a film department, and they never bring the two together. Yeah, I, I just got an invite, and you guys may have also been invited to uh, USC's songwriting department does an annual showcase for their seniors when they graduate. And I got the invite for that. And while you're sitting here talking about this, I thought, you know, I hear kids in that department that are absolutely good enough that they should be, um, you know, their music should be getting used. Mm-hmm. I would bring USC film department and USC music department, or songwriting department. Right, 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 saying. right. They there you go. Come yeah. together. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So yeah. can we go back to something you mentioned at the beginning of the show, Bobby, which was um, working for free? Uh, We haven't talked about what people can expect to get paid for these things, how they should set prices for the different types of um, sinks that they would be getting, and when are the right times for you to say, you know what, or if somebody says, I'd love to have your music on my actor reel, but I can't afford to pay you because, uh, you know, I work at uh, a restaurant waiting tables. I'm not wealthy. Um, 
do you give it away at that point? When do you right. know? Well, well, no, I mean, we should definitely, you know, this is something we should definitely talk about. Um, do you want to talk, a, do you have more of these to go? Yeah, we, and I oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 let's talk about this, but definitely we have like maybe two more to do, but let me, since you asked, let's, let's just jump on it. I, right. I first want to make it very clear that, I mean, we could have a conversation, or this could be a whole session mm -hmm. on, you know, the value of music mm -hmm. and the, the, you know, free, and that could be a whole nother discussion. And I know that a lot of people can get very passionate about this kind of conversation. So I want to make it really clear that what I'm saying is that in the very, very beginning, when you're starting out, um, oftentimes, the experience is the pay. And a lot of times when people put pay first before experience, they are never given the opportunity for the experience. So, mm -hmm. you know, I definitely I don't wanna make this like a value of music conversation because that's not what I mean. I totally think that music should be paid for and it should be valued. But there's a time when, you know, you do have to be an intern or you do have to, you know, uh, put so yourself So how, out when there. it's time to start charging, how do you know what to charge? Yeah, Michael, you wanna take that? Uh, <laughs> I love the way. Of you course, yeah, I love that it was like this. <laughs> it was like the hook, right? Uh, well, first on on that, um, because I think this is important too. It, just as that is an, an important thing, because I totally agree with you. We've all we've all been the boy Fridays. I mean, it's impressive that you were like, "Ooh, wow!" when you read off like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. But I mean, like. I was literally like getting people's lunches and coffee. I mean, it wasn't Look incredibly gram glamorous, okay? But I mean, what I think in those conversations where they don't have money, I think what is really important for us to be communicating to anyone that anybody is dealing with is that music has value. So maybe they, they don't have money, but craft the discussion in such a way that they feel that there is at least a value exchange. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I I understand in your film that you don't really have a lot, you don't have any money, but hey, I don't really have a lot of credits, so I love the connection, but you know what, in case your thing gets really successful, I wanna make sure that like I get to own all my music. You're not gonna take any publishing. Mm -hmm. I'll keep my publishing. I wanna have, you know, the credit in at the end of the movie, you know, and maybe if it's like an opening or end title song, you can try to get as big of a credit as possible, maybe compared to the other music. Like make sure that there is some exchange so yeah. that the, uh, the lesson a... is taught of music does have value. Maybe it's not necessarily in the form of green, you know, yeah. George Washington things or whatever. But it's like, as long as everyone feels that there's a value exchange, then mm -hmm. we're not going to lose down the line. And I, I arranged what's, what, what's known as a step deal. When, when, yeah. I, when I, a director approached me and said, we, I want to use your music, but we don't have any money. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you can use it for purposes of showcases film festivals and that type of thing. But if you get a distribution deal at any point, then yep. it has to be renegotiated, so. But I guess to your point of like, how do you know what to charge? You know, I mean. Yeah, is it 25 bucks or 2,500? Hey, look, every, the good news and the bad news about the world of sync is that it's the wild, wild mm -hmm. west. Mm -hmm. You can kind of do whatever feels right. So, you know, I think it's ultimately about communication of what, you know, like in your example, what do you charge? So like, all right, well, how much other music are you using? You know, am I the only one? Are there other people? Are the other songs being used in the same way in which my song is being used? Mm -hmm. If so, then maybe we can do what's called a most favored nations thing where everybody's getting paid the same. So, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you only have 500 bucks, you know, well, I typically get 5,000, but I'm okay with 500 <laughs> mm -hmm. as long as I know your four other songs that right. you're using in the film are also getting 500. And like, not let's 5, all be treated, right. Right. Exactly. treated yeah. equally. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you're, there's almost no general uh, answer to that in the sense that, you know, every project that we all deal with is different, you know. And yes, of course, if it is a... TV show that's produced by a major studio or a film produced by a major film, we do kind of know, kind of just going in what that range is. And there's 
lots of different books on on the subject. I think I even maybe address it in a ballpark range in in the five star makeover publishing chapter I did. I know Bobby mm-hmm. addresses a bunch of Bray other Bex books. They, they have the Braybacks, mm-hmm. music, money, and success that <laughs> they kind do of a thing. Lot, yeah. You know, but I, I think still again, it's it's all about communication and making it easy for your thing to get used. You need to also make sure that you're not ever gonna, you know. Be perceived as if you're not sticking up for what you do and that what you do has value so you know you were talking about your social IQ and social like so much of these sort of discussions are if someone is an incredibly shy wallflower they're not going to be really good about having that conversation mm-hmm. so then maybe you need to know that you got to bring in somebody else to just sort of like hey man so I love that you want to use my song you right. know what do you feel you have in the budget oh you only have that well Let's think about different ways Mm -hmm. or, you know, if there isn't that much money, but, you know, my song is an important part of your film, maybe you can give me some footage that I could use in a music video. Right. You know, so that we have a little bit of a barter and I'm promoting your film when I'm promoting my video and vice versa. An actor reel. I mean, that's going to get seen thousands of times mm -hmm. over a period of a few years. Having a music credit in the lower left, like, you know, an MTV style credit for the music. Great exposure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's... You just yeah, you, you gotta take each situation different, but you you just need to assess. It's almost sort of like you have something that I want. I I now want something. I need something that you have. Mm-hmm. If that's money or money and a combination of something else, I think before you go in knowing and being able to articulate what they can give you that brings you that value. You're Let's do off. a mock negotiation. You're a musician. I'm Stormy Daniels. I need your music. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Okay, move Is on. it because we're in the valley that you still bring up this porn? No, angle? it's because I heard that Michael Aven- <laughs> some news blurb about Michael Avenatti, who I think is just a oh um, yeah, a, he got un- unusual guy arrested today. Or oh, something. he did, or something. I think right. He yeah, got he brought was up on extortion charges oh, or something. Yeah, something. But we just gave him more publicity by me mentioning it. So pretend that I didn't say that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we got to uh, let's maybe two oh, more. Oh yeah, we go? Your, yeah. So I mean, uh, again, I mean, well. I mean, this is a pretty pretty basic one here. Um, right. You know, there's cor- I mean, uh, companies, corporations are, um, always have their websites, and on their websites, when they're talking about what it is that they do, uh, they have music behind there. So, corporate videos is is definitely a way that you can get your music exposed. Maybe these can be smaller local companies to you, um, rather than the the big ones. Obviously, there would be more bureaucracy with the bigger companies. But if there's local small companies and they have their website where they're demonstrating what it is that they do, and you have your music synced to that, again, that's that's exposure, uh, you know, and potentially money as well, and uh, and it, you know. Uh, more to show, you know, in terms of when people are wanting to know what you can do. There's more links to show. There's more things to put on your website to demonstrate your work and your abilities. And credibility. So, yeah. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So it's just another thing. Um, while you're talking about that, I'm thinking, you know, I grew up in a small farm town and there was like a grain elevator that was a business, a place where they, people, the farmers after harvesting would bring their grain, dump it into the thing and it would get sold or transported or whatever. So there's an example of a local business that probably nowadays would have a website. Here's the cool thing about it. They're not sophisticated buyers, so they don't know that they could go to a small music library and license a piece of music for online only for $25, let's say. (laughs) But if you approach them and and you made a piece of music and got a meeting with the guy who owns the grain elevator, say, give me 250 bucks and we're good. Right, it's a right, small right. enough number for him, but probably 10 times what you would get if you were in a small library. And that grain elevator is never really going to look at, you know, right, right, you're, right. you're making the sale. And you're, and keep you're in handing mind, him an idea. And, and also, you know, you can customize it for them as well. Right. And even lyrically, you can customize it with their with the name of their company in there. And you can even name the, the proprietors of the business, you know. And, Come on, and tell Sally me and John and yeah. <laughs> whatever you can. Bob's grain And elevator. you never know where it goes because there's a guy that I know here in L.A. that we've all, if you, do you guys remember this closet world? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Closet huh? world. Yeah. Like this, so guy now, that I, now this, do... this guy that I know years ago. Oh, we've sung other songs. We're not clear. Uh oh. Um, but, That's uh, right. You know, he did it as a thing, I think at this point, 15 years ago, you yeah. know, sort of like, 
a total knockoff, let me sort of do like your thing going into Circle Liquors. Mm -hmm. You know, and here we are 15 years later that it's like still airing on local television. Wow. And so, you know what else he did? The guy was crazy. not dumb. Yeah. He started using animated characters instead of actors. Remember that? Towards the, you know, mm -hmm. some point like the late 90s, early 2000s, he had like a little robot character in the closet and he did that to avoid having to pay any side <laughs> fees. I wow. thought that was brilliant. <laughs> and he could kind of keep recycling the commercial every yeah. year. Look at little uh, little general car insurance with the little animated general. Right. Animated. right. I wow. actually never really thought That's about that That's why they before. do that. <laughs> I'm always thinking about stuff like that. Or now, now you're getting me into the Cadbury egg thing. Like every year, Cadbury runs the same commercial with the rabbit and the, like, I'm trying to think what it was. Every year around yeah. Easter, I see the same commercial, but I'd never really thought about it. If the rabbit doesn't need residuals, that's right. probably like that's why they keep doing that. This rabbit thing every is year. sag free. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then the last one is just co-writes. I mean, if you know somebody that's, I mean, the quickest way into this is if you know somebody that's already into it and you meet with them and you start co-writing. And that brings us to the Taxi Road Rally because one of the amazing yeah. ways to meet people that are already doing stuff is to come to the Road Rally. It's coming up. You guys are probably already planning it, right? November 4th. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. November 7th through the 10th. November 7th through, November 7th through, through the 10th. There you go. You come out to the Road Rally, I'm you meet people. I'm asking her every question from now on. <laughs> she's got all the she answers. Has, she's got it, like, right there. Yes, she does. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good way. I mean, you meet other people that are already writing, right? And you co-write with them. And then, you know, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, uh, you know, some of my, some of the people and, and clients that I have, actually the quickest way in is by, you know, they said, hey, I was hanging out at a boot camp, you know, at a CSAC boot camp or songwriters boot camp or right. something of that nature. And I met somebody that was already placing stuff and we kind of connected and I started writing with him and boom, we got something placed, you know, so. I would say. Some things to think about. 20 to 30 percent of all taxi placements. Got to remember with taxi, it's not just I submit a song and I got a placement. There's a, a geometric thing that happens to taxi members. Um, yes, I got a song in a music library, which is not a placement, it's a publishing deal. Uh, I got it in there and eventually the library owner said to me, oh, can you produce a collection of 10 more attention cues for me like that? Mm -hmm. And Whoa. now can you do something else? And can you do something else? So over a period of two or three years, this taxi member that started out with one, pla not one placement, one deal right. through a taxi submission now has 50 pieces of music in that library Damn. that are going out to various mm -hmm. shows. That's blah, awesome. Blah, blah. Yeah. And now they go to the road rally and they're having a beer yeah, with yeah. the library owner and yeah. their friend comes over and sits down with them oh i didn't even think about this but he does great orchestral stuff which i don't do mm -hmm. right so uh, i would say somewhere around 20 30 percent of all taxi music that makes it on air happens because of the road rally exactly yeah, what you're talking that's about great. co writes and introductions all that stuff that's great yeah so well i think what i love about his co-write thing and all these things that we're talking about you said geometric but i'm going to go to like the circle it's like everyone you meet is its own little concentric circle venn diagram. Venn diagram. So, yeah, we're finally you know, using our venn, yeah, diagram. venn diagram so it's sort of like <laughs> the more people you meet and the more contacts you then access their you know mm -hmm circle or Venn-ish, mm -hmm. right? yeah. whatever the term is, you get it. But it's sort of like the more you know and if as long as you are good with your social IQ and everyone yeah, enjoys yeah, talking yeah. to you, you're just, your thing is going to expand and expand and mm -hmm. expand. Yep, that's absolutely true, yeah. So there you guys go. I mean, there's, there's our short list. I mean, we could keep on going. I mean, even if we wanted to continue, we can say, uh, you know, um, use resource guides like the music business registries. I mean, that's a way to get to know the different players in the business. You know, sign up for, well, you already signed up for companies like, uh, you know, Taxi, where you're, you're getting listings and you're, and you're hearing about new opportunities. Yeah, baby. <laughs> you know, um, these are definitely all ways, you know, to, to, to get that ball rolling and to, and to kind of break in. And, and again, I can't stress the fact that what we're talking about here is having a long, you know, term approach to this. You know, it's just like, you know, the personal finance in the stock market. I mean, for any of you guys that are into investing, you know, one of the, you know, what, what, what you learn is that you have to think the long road, you know, because if you're just thinking these little quick get rich kind of things, you might hit once in a while, but at the end of the day, you're probably going to be down. You know, you have to think long term and you, may, you need to make that investment and the payoff will come. Amen. How can right? I, how can I? How, I can't follow that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I want to 
Talk about a topic that we've spoken about in the last couple episodes of Taxi TV, and it's related to this. And I want to start out by saying that TuneCore, CD Baby, Distro Kid, there are probably others out there. I'm not saying anything negative about these companies at all. They're fine companies. But they, the online distribution companies have checkboxes where you can check off, I, you know, would you like us to monetize any placements on YouTube? Yes. Would you like us to be your sync publisher? Um, they come in various shapes and sizes, and I'm not going to pretend that I can espouse the, the various ins and outs of, of their agreements, but something that has been hitting my desk because of this show. Uh, we play taxi member music on the show quite frequently, and I get copyright notices w before I sit down for dinner after doing a yeah. show from YouTube, uh, and, and it'll say, you know, this is copyrighted by CD Baby or published by CD Baby or DistroKid right. or, or TuneCore. So last week uh, I had Bob Mayer, uh, who's a music library on uh, music library owner, is, is my guest on the show, and we were re um, reviewing music together. And I said, by the way, you know, if there's anything you'd like to sign, feel free to raise your hand and say I'd like to sign that. Mm -hmm. Well, out of the nine or ten things we listened to, four or five of them, he said I'd like to sign those, and they were very good, absolutely signable, hmm. and. Um, Guess what? All of those people, before I, we went out to dinner afterwards, before we even hit the parking lot of the restaurant across the freeway, I already had copyright notices on my phone from YouTube. All the stuff he wanted to sign was already signed to a publisher. Hmm. And I don't believe that these people remembered that they checked those boxes or even realized that they were signed to a publishing deal. Now, it could just be some other form, like an admin deal or something, but as in particular, my question is, um, what happens if you kind of unwittingly uh, check that box, went, oh, hell yeah, you can monetize my music for me, or you forgot that you checked that box four years ago when mm -hmm. you put that piece mm -hmm. of music online, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or signed up with them to distribute it for you um, through iTunes and wherever. Um, and now these people are submitting their music to Taxi and to libraries directly, and I'll bet you 30% of all the music in production music libraries, ranging from the tiniest little one-person operation up to the big boys, I'll bet you that 20, 30, 40% of the music is encumbered somehow with one of those wow. Things. It's a thing that nobody's yeah. thinking about. I'll jump on for two seconds. And, and yeah, yeah, over. go for it. So, yeah. I mean, one of the things I would say for sure, I mean, I think uh, so, sort of by habit, you know, a lot of times when you're signing up for things online, you just want to, yeah, yeah, I agree, whatever. You know, right. we all kind of sometimes tend to do that when you're kind of registering for something online. And, and, and that's obviously something that you don't want to do, right? Especially in this particular instance. Right. The second instance, uh, the second thing I wanted to add was just simply... Um, uh, I did speak with some of the folks at these different organizations that you're talking about, uh, just to kind of ask them about it. And, and and pretty much what they said was, yeah, when you check that box, you know, you're giving us the rights to administration. And we ask for a year, simply because when you're collecting uh, monies, especially overseas, I mean, it takes a while to collect. So we ask for at least a year. But yes, if you are planning on doing something else somewhere else, especially don't another sign, publishing deal with a library or right, a publisher. Right. Don't click that box essentially so well and I think a lot of it because I totally agree with what you were saying up top of you know I have friends that work at all these companies and CD Baby and, and all of that and you know they all work hard and they provide yeah. I think a very valuable service Absolutely. if there's anything that I would I guess m critique for lack of a better word is that you know these these boxes that you know there's i think it's a mixture of we're all used to just like okay yeah let's check the box but then to me it's all sort of in the information that's being presented like for me as as a publisher and there's i have lots of competitors at some level i'm sort of a competitor with cd baby and tunecore and, and others we're not singling out those two but i think it's more to get someone to realize that it's a big marketplace. You have lots of options. This option that's being presented in front of you with a checkbox is not your only option. And a lot of different folks to me have sort of said that their feeling was that like, oh, well, I felt I had to check that box 
Mm. Or I would miss out on this money that I, because they don't necessarily know that, well, you can also collect this same money any number of different ways. Mm -hmm. This isn't just your only way. It still may be the one way in which it makes the most sense for you to do it. And that's fine. You should do it. But I think it's more of just like making sure that like even though it's been made very easy for us with checkboxes, just do your research of, oh, hey, if I'm going to release my own record, I'm my own record label. So what are all the things attendant to being a record label that I should be aware of and maybe inform myself of? <laughs> but they're going to your point of it's right there in front of them. They may feel that if they don't check the box and they complete the sign-up process without checking the publishing or admin or whatever box is staring them in the face, that if they don't do it, then maybe they can't go back in time and correct that and go back and go, well, now I, I've done my homework. I, I've done right. the due diligence. I'd like to, oh, crap, I already finished signing up. So maybe there's a little bit of that, uh, you the, know. I, certainly, I hadn't FOMO. really thought of that, of mm -hmm. can you go back later and add yeah, it? I don't know that You probably question. can. It's certainly like with the CD Baby Pro Thing, I think you can because that's a separate yeah, right. add-on service. But I think a lot of people would be just a... grab it in the moment because it's there and they don't want yeah. to miss out. Sure. Right. I it, personally think. I mean, you know, I've called some of these organizations again. It's very, very, very easy to get in touch with operators that will answer that simple question. You know, can right. we come back and, ch and, and check right. it off? I think also one of the other points is is that if they don't check it. What, then what do I, what do I do? You know because the, right. then they. What don't are my other options? All those it's other easy options right now said. in the moment to be like you know let me do let this. someone else do it. Right. Yeah, because I mean all those other options you talk about they don't really understand. Like for example, there's a lot of people that are confused with copyright registration and title registration at a PRO, for example, they think it's the same thing. Right. Oh, I already registered my, my my copyrights. And I go, what do you mean? It goes, when I signed up for ASCAP, I had to do a title registration. Right. ASCAP and is my publisher. You know, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yes, no, it's yeah. true. And, uh, so the then I don't have to do the copyright registration at the copyright office. And, 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 you know, and there's a lot of confusion and it's a very, very complicated business. And the, and the thing is, is that it's hard enough just to be good Right? Let's not forget that. I mean, none of this matters in, unless unless you're good. So you have to practice your instrument. You have to get good at your instrument. You have to get good at songwriting. And now you have to worry about all of this other confusing stuff. Right. I mean, it's really it's really challenging. You know, but it's like any other business. You wouldn't own a pizza place without understanding how to effectively right. cost effectively can't purchase just make, the yeah. ingredients. That's and, right. And sure. How yeah. much to pay the people yeah. that work part, for you? And how it. much about rent and advertising mm -hmm. and location? It's yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of it. Uh, Totally. And you can't ignore any of it. Yeah, yeah, it's part well, of it. Well, and on a related note to this whole intro to music publishing too. at UCLA, that's where they can write <laughs> April first. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> Is um, you know in those you know agreements where you're checking the box, what I would highly encourage everyone to do because you know when you when you write something and until you enter an agreement with somebody else, you are the publisher. Mm -hmm. And what I have seen a lot, even having nothing to do with this the origin of the question that you ask, is that everyone assumes that, oh, I don't need to set up a publishing company. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's, you know, this is a huge and, and, one. And unfor yeah. you know, some of the PROs don't necessarily help that process no. by just saying, oh, you can just sign up as a writer and yeah. we'll pay your publisher share through your writer account. And it's like There's no, some weird like stuff this is a little on. bit of a yeah. um, a soapbox for me of trying to get, mm -hmm. you know, the PROs now to try to start to encourage everyone to set up your publishing company because, I mean, since I do so much sync, you know, cue sheets that get generated at the end of a project that list all the chronological use of music have a column for writers and a column for publishers. There's a reason why there's two columns. Mm -hmm. If you have your name in the publisher column. Every other PRO around the world, other than the one that you're the member of that said you could, we'll pay you your publisher share through your writer account, everyone else doesn't know that. So your publishing share could be in limbo and you might not ever yeah. sort of get it. But when you, what I have seen happen and have personally had to get involved and amend and extract, for lack of a better word, is when you sign up for these sorts of click deals where there is an admin it is technically only an admin deal however mm -hmm. if you don't have a publishing company set up that company is going to list their publisher name as right. oh. the publisher of record uh -huh. even though you have a piece of paper that says they're just administering for you 
they need to register something in all these databases. A publisher has to be listed. So you enter into an admin deal. You don't have a publishing company name. The company that you entered into the agreement with through your click thing is going to list their ASCAP company, their BMI company, whatever. So to the world, it looks as if they are the original publisher, mm -hmm, which is sort right. of the term we hear of a lot. Mm -hmm. So that should you want to go into another deal, and like a lot of these, even after that first year, like I believe most of them are at like 30 day notice. It's not mm -hmm. like you are like signing away your life, you know. It, it, you can cancel on maybe a 30-day rolling basis after that first year, maybe. I don't know. I don't know all they the all have, specific They're varying terms. degrees of out clauses. Yeah. So, you know, but but when you, you... It's always a bit of a challenge to transition from one agreement to another. But if you have... If you're transitioning out of an agreement where someone else used their publishing company name as the publisher of record when they registered things and you're going somewhere else... It's an added complication because it's almost like you literally need a document that sort of shows like so and so is assigning their rights over to now your new company that maybe you had to set and up in this new deal. Make this and it just takes time yeah. and it gets confusing. You so have I to would know say, about it and execute yeah. it. Most people just don't. Yeah, just well. set up your own company name. It's just a DBA of you personally, yeah. so it's not like it's incredibly difficult to do. A lot of people ask that question because they think, uh, should I start my own publishing company? And I tell them, if you want to get paid, yes, they need an entity to send mm -hmm. a check to. But a lot of people think that it's almost like a vanity thing, that if I have a publishing company name and I'm pitching my music, people in the industry will take me more seriously because it's coming from a publisher. Hmm. But if it's you know Betty Jo's music from Pure, it's... it's it's not quite the same, although times have certainly changed and there are plenty of smaller publishers out there, but I don't think any music supervisor in the history of the industry or any artist at a label looking for songs for their next record has said, wow, look at that, they've got a publishing company, I'll take that, that piece of music and, right, and, and right. use it because of that. Yeah. It, it's yeah. just to no, make I sure that you've you. got, it's yeah. making sure your business is taken care of. Well, well, like as Michael said, people don't realize that when you, you know, when you create a, uh, a song, you not only inherit the rights as the author and owner of the song, but you are also the music publisher until you sign those rights away. And people imagine, you know, starting a publishing company, you know, registering with right. ASCAP and like, you know, claiming your publishing name and stuff like that, you know, means that you now have to get a building with a sign out front, right. and a parking right. garage. I and need to incorporate an yeah, yeah, LLC. Yeah, 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 what do yeah, I do? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, none you don't that. need to do yeah, any of that. None of that, no. You yeah. could, but you know, you I absolutely about, can. Yeah. I don't know about other states, but in California, if you're a corporation, you have to pay eight hundred bucks a year mm -hmm. just to say you're a corporation mm -hmm. to the tax Correct. man. Yeah. So yeah, you might want to start out on the skinny side. Just go DBA, and, and once you've got an income flow, and then maybe, you know, your corporation is going to shield you from some lawsuits or something. Um, yeah, right, those are making, better problems to have because it means yeah. you're making more money. Right. More than likely. And somebody's so. going to try and take it away from you. <laughs> yeah. Scumbag. <laughs> but does that answer your, so, yeah. your thing? Okay. So uh, you know what's another issue is this thing you were talking about with, uh, you know, directors who are actually, or, or oh, filmmakers. Oh, indie right? filmmakers. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to talk about this. This is almost a show that we should do for indie filmmakers. But we're constantly looking for new ways to get opportunities for taxi members. Mm -hmm. And we've had two or three indie filmmakers that keep, keep coming back to the taxi well uh, every time they do a film, which is about every three or four years, they're kind of on a cycle, develop, sure. you know, find a top or find a story, development, blah, blah, blah. So they use an inordinate amount of music. Uh, one of the, there's a big music supervisor who does name brand TV shows who also does indie films from time to time. And last time she ran listings with Taxi I want to say eight out of nine pieces of music in that movie uh, and songs I'm talking were all from taxi members hmm. and this is a discerning woman that knows what she's doing this isn't some like cheapo film with a you know a so-called music supervisor the real deal another gentleman just surfaced the other day that used us three or four years ago on a film and I, over the weekend I looked at uh, that film half the music in that film was taxi members hmm. oh cool so That's great. we know that we've got the right music and we're constantly reaching out, trying to find other filmmakers, indie filmmakers that are working on projects that are like half a million up to maybe three, four, five million dollars. Um, 
It, it's shocking to me, Michael uh, and Bobby. It, it, it's beyond shocking to me how many of these people, directors and producers, say, um, I can only use royalty-free music because I don't want to be writing checks oh, every yeah. quarter. Mm -hmm. They literally think that if they yeah. use a piece of music that doesn't come from a royalty-free library, of which there are different varieties, and that's a whole other show, that they're going to personally have to write a check every quarter to the musicians should those shows air on TV. They don't understand that it's the network that licenses the right. music and exactly. pays the PRO. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's pretty I, straightforward, actually. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. But, how, but, but I wonder I, where they're getting that. Like, from, where, I can tell you exactly where they're getting it. Okay. From other filmmakers who don't know. It, it's like, uh -huh. it, it's... And maybe I, even from the uh, the promotion and advertising of these, you know, royalty free, uh, you know, <laughs> services that are trying to entice filmmakers to maybe, use their services. Uh, yeah. You know, I started hanging out on forums, film independent filmmaker forums, mm -hmm. and, and going where they go and where they congregate and where they learn from each other. And, yeah, and, that's, that's you know, crazy. trade lighting people or sound guys or whatever, and. Literally 99% of the discussion is, well, dude, you want to use this royalty-free library because you don't want to be writing checks. Right, right. Hmm. They yeah. are absolutely and utterly clueless. Somebody started that rumor years ago and it propagated. Mm -hmm. And the whole community... I will join you in let's dismiss or dispel yeah, yeah, this yeah. propagation. You, sure. Would you like to join me and do a... Uh, like the? 200 seat theater at the hotel where we do the red red. I'm thinking about doing an indie filmmaker sure, afternoon absolutely. on a Saturday to edge indie filmmakers smart. come and learn how where to find the music and how you should license it and by the way you don't have to only because they complain oh I had to go to a royalty free library and everything sounded like cheap canned music right yeah, yeah, no, it's they don't have to worry about these kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, and, no. and you should take that little show on the road, actually, and I can have you guys come and maybe uh, <laughs> yeah. speak at, uh, you know, where there are people making, uh, you know, independent films or learning how to make them. For example, at UCLA, UCLA. Film School, USC Film School, or Absolutely. Film School Across the Street from Musicians Institute, you know, and, and go directly to the to the actual, you know, filmmakers. So. I'll join you. I'll yeah. be the moderator. I mean, All right. I, I, <laughs> it, it, it's... Really disturbing to me that an entire industry, an entire layer of up and coming people in the industry are, are tying their hands behind their back when it comes to using music, which is so important to a film. Uh, and, and they're settling for pretty crappy music in a lot of cases. Yeah. There's uh, some of these databases. I mean, sometimes there's good music, and, and sometimes there's a lot of stuff you have to weed through, and uh, and you know the quality of the music, and, and sometimes it's good, and the sound quality of the music isn't good. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm I'm even saw that sometimes these uh, these agreements that you get into w with them are not so easy to understand either. So. Um, maybe what you guys could do is you could take the link to the show and send it to your friend who's uh, you know learning how to be a film uh, you know director or producer, and um, so you can kind of spread. Go. Well, even tying into what we were talking about earlier, it's sort of like well, if any of the folks here run into this situation, well, then you go to that director or whatever and say, hey, listen, you don't need to use the royalty free library. There you Use go. me, yeah, yeah, as the original composer, and I'm part of a band, mm -hmm. and you know we can do, you know, I, I, that's where I think at some level it's, why wouldn't anyone be attracted to music that feels custom to what they're doing? I would yeah. think that would be far more appealing than the canned library music that you could end up hearing in a hundred different independent films. Absolutely, you know, so. Uh, but no, I, they, we need to dispel that. I mean, it's funny, like, that, tying back one of the things you were saying earlier, there's, like, that misconception. There's some of these, you know, the way the YouTube, I mean, like it or not, however one feels about Google, you know, YouTube is serving a purpose. They are the worst streaming platform in the world as far as the rates that all the rest of us who represent or work with creators get paid but i mean you watched. can't you can't deny at the moment that they have all the eyeballs it's the second largest search engine in the world yeah, yeah. right after google so a lot world. but yeah. this you know a lot of this monetizing online with youtube you know it it kind of ties into what you're saying with these filmmakers of you know that i mean that's an automated system because part of the whole idea is we as content people have to provide reference files and all these sorts of things yeah. to YouTube for them to help us monetize. Part of that problem is because there's so many people that are ripping stuff off that we needed a way 
to identify it. You're not ripping anybody off with if anything you're promoting the music with what you and bob did a week ago yeah but it's sort of like everyone's still having to work within a system of we've still got to try to do something to police it but unfortunately in the policing you catch things in the net that you wouldn't necessarily want to catch and i think everyone's just trying to find out the best way of how do you deal with the system but i think the other thing is you know when someone gets caught uh, in, in this, the YouTube sort of content ID stuff, it's like they feel like, oh my God, I'm being policed, I'm being caught, I've done something wrong. Like, no, just like talk to everybody. You know, what I mean, like we represent a video game company whose music is all over the internet, but they don't want it all monetized or in that sort of world because all it takes is one fan to bitch, however unjustified and. Um, you know, oh, I wanted to use this music and I can't believe, you know, uh, corporate America is saying that they're monetizing my thing and I can't believe, you like, the, I, all video game companies I've learned is sort of like, you know, so much of that world is YouTube gameplay and everything. They're not wanting to monetize it because all it takes in social media is one influencer or one someone to sort of be complaining even if they don't have no clue what they're talking about, all it takes is that negative perception of something to be talked about. I just think if everyone can communicate about all of this, let's communicate about how music gets used, what's involved, how much does it cost. Here's a you great know. example of, of a misnomer or a bad communication that's gone viral. Over the years, a lot of people have called Taxi a pay-for-play service. It's not. Yeah. Uh, mm. It's not at all. Pay for play means that you pay to club. Here's a thousand dollars so we can pay in your club tonight, and we're going to sell tickets to our friends to come to the club to try and recoup that cost. Right. If taxi were pay to play, you would be, we would be setting you up with situations where you pay the director to be in a movie, or you pay a producer or a music supervisor to be in a show. There is no pay for play right. with taxi. We're right. basically sure. kind of like paying your accountant to do your taxes. We provide a service <laughs> for a fee. It's a service of opportunity and some education that makes yeah. you good enough to yeah, seize the absolutely. opportunities. Right. But it's funny how things stick. All it took was one person, you know, 20 years ago say, oh, taxi, pay for play. And yeah. it yeah. sticks even though it's wrong. Yeah, right, right. I totally get it. Yeah. Fake news. <laughs> no, I should have seen that yeah. one coming. I really hadn't planned on that. But, uh, Michael Avenatti called me and told me to say it. <laughs> um, let's do some Q&A because we've got eight minutes left. Uh, yeah, there was something else I wanted to ask you. I'll save it for another show. Something you've addressed before that I th think is important. But you know what? I, I want these guys to have a chance to ask questions. Um, so ask your questions. I don't even need to wait for Bria to send them to me because I've got the computer nice and close this week. <laughs> so if you have any two questions for these highly knowledgeable and very articulate guests, now would be the time. Maybe while they're writing those questions or typing them in, I will ask you that other thing if I can remember what the heck it was. Oh, you once said in the show, and you're absolutely right, that um, if you get music on a YouTube video and you're the songwriter, you're going to see less revenue from that than if you're the person performing it. Uh, yes, correct. How much of a difference is there? <laughs> All right, so I'm not like the complete YouTube expert here. It has become honestly such a complex world where that experts really do exist. Yeah, I, I, However, yeah. I can sort of at least address you know, the way the YouTube world kind of started, which is the, you know, and this is mainly for what YouTube calls UGC, user generated content. So a lot of music gets used and we know there's two copyrights. There's the publishing copyright, there's the master copyright. When YouTube started, and generally I think the, the percentages have slid around a little bit, but generally this is kind of how it was originally set up and as, derivated very little from, which is if someone doesn't use a master recording and, you know, I go on YouTube right now and I just sing something a cappella myself, nothing gets paid to a master owner because there is no master, but there is a publishing fee. So in that user generated world, the ad money that Google sells, it's 
had it generally got split 50 50 Google kept 50 and then the 50 percent that was left over in my acapella example the full 50 percent would go to the songwriter and the publisher okay okay when there's a master recording involved that same scenario applies where Google is taking their 50%, but that remaining 50% actually gets split 35% to the master and 15% to the publisher. So you are the master owner if you sit on a stool in your bedroom and point a camera at your face and sing a song a cappella. Right. You yeah. you are, but but that is still something different in the YouTube world where I was talking about reference files, where uh, you're having to submit these different reference files of existing master recordings. When you're in uh, that world where there's an existing master recording, put aside the new one you have just done because I did my a cappella thing, that money is going to be allocated within the YouTube system t over twice to the master recording and once to the publisher, the 15 to 35. And like when YouTube first started to go out, you know, they were explaining this and I kind of raised my hand and was like, well, if you need me to opt in to agree to this, why don't I just say that I'm only going to do it if it's 50-50? Because that's the way our sync world works, mm -hmm. right? Is usually it's 50 to the publisher and 50 to the master. Uh, and, you know, the response basically was like, well, don't do business with YouTube. You know, the, <laughs> the master owners, particularly the major labels, have been very effective I don't agree with the argument but especially now the way things are they are their argument was always we've invested so ridiculous amounts of money in developing and touring mm -hmm. and this and that that we deserve more than the songwriters and the publishers well maybe that was true back in the day I could see that but these days not so sure that really holds as much weight with me because publishers are having to be more of an A&R source there's lots of A&R sources we got right. people being discovered on YouTube like it's, but it is what it is. You kind of just fight what you can within the system and then get into the system. At least my view of it is you try to just fight to keep pushing up, you know, your rates, whole other show, all the stuff that's been going on with Spotify and Music Modernization Act and all that kind of stuff. It's like we're getting incremental increases. We're still getting paid far less than the master owners are. But they're under a different set of rules. So let's work within the system to try to just get uh, push up what songwriters and publishers get paid. Somebody asked a question, uh, as a publisher, what are the three key assets you look for when potentially signing writers? What convinces you that a writer had a lot to offer you from a publishing perspective? You're the one signing Wow, them. all right, good question. Good songs? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I would think really, I mean, I know that's the corny <laughs> response, but I would, I would, elaborate on it in the sense of you know and and we talk about this a lot when I've spoken at songwriting conferences and festivals and whatnot that you know if you were to distill everything down everybody writes about the same kind of stuff you know things that either hurt you broke your heart you're in love like whatever the situation is right but I think what is the most the the biggest key asset to this question is are you telling that story or expressing that idea in a new and different way unique you know mm -hmm. i i've heard i i've lost track of how many god knows probably tens of thousands of songs at this point that i've heard in my life but you know eight times out of ten a lot of the songs are saying the exact same thing like and yes i I would say I am a songwriter. It's more was a songwriter because I don't have any time now. But yeah. I think it is natural as anyone is writing a lyric that you're going to write what is familiar to you. Mm -hmm. So that's either what you're the way you're speaking a vernacular or perhaps the way someone else has previously expressed it in song. Right. So, you know, I, I know a lot of lyric writers and they painstakingly go over every single word because they don't want... You know, they don't want to say it in the same way that someone else has. Right. So I just That's think craft. It's, it's all right. about, you know, how can I talk about the exact same thing that everyone writes songs about? Helium. And the, the, look at you. What do you say? He keeps referencing Mikey Wax into this oh. sort of thing. I said, I said Helium, <laughs> which is actually a very unique, uh, an artist that he signed that had a very unique way of saying the, the a, guy that was the theme. spinning thing from my right. earlier story, you right. know, sort of wrote this song about helium, and it was about sort of, you know, 
you know, just a positive, up tempo, you know, you lift me up type of, you know, sort of thing. It's helium. like, well, helium. And use helium you know, as the metaphor. Great. Right? You, you yeah, just yeah, take, like again, yeah. you take yeah. it from a different perspective mm-hmm. and you write it in a new and different way, and mm-hmm. that becomes memorable in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so, but the question was three key assets. So I'd say sort of the first one is certainly writing songs that are unique and attractive and different and in their own way, expressing this the same sentiment, but yet in a different new way. Um, it's also got to be in sort of, especially for us, because for Sync, we do so much with, at least with independent artists, it's called All In. So it's, you know, it's it's the recording and the publishing mm-hmm. all at once. It's got to be, it's got to be an appealing vocal. Like, mm-hmm. it's one thing that, a great song I do feel still will come across as a great song, regardless of who performs it. More likely for an artist pitch, but for film and TV, the vocal's got to be broadcastable. Well, it, yes, but I mean, here's the irony, I think, with some of that, though, is that there's, it's a fine balance of, you want the vocal to be broad. I mean, you want it to be of a professional enough le- level where it doesn't sound like a demo, if right. that's sort of what you mean by broadcasting. Well, but mm-hmm. you, it also, you have to be careful, depending on what it is, if the vocal is so far out in front, right. it'll never get used because mm-hmm. it'll always interrupt with dialogue. It comes down also to authenticity. If you're doing a Tom Waits kind of thing, you know, it might sound like you, you gargled with gravel and, and you know, Absolutely. Got but drunk it, or something. <laughs> but in the right context, that is a broadcastable vocal. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's singing, fine, finding singing the right... Singing a Tom Waits song like Whitney Houston ain't going to work either. Absolutely. Well, because I guess, again, it's got to be in a believable. It's got, you've got to know that this performance has captured what that song right. is. To your point from earlier, Buy Me a Rose, both Kenny and Luther Vandross's performance were fantastic, they t- they interpreted the same song. It had to be a great song to begin with for both artists of that stature to have recorded it, and especially for Luther not to have been afraid that Kenny had had a number one with it. So why why should I even do it? But they both, you know, everything that they touched has their own unique performance. Like it, you can't not hear it and be gravitated towards it. You yeah. know, and some artists may write great songs, but frankly, they're not great singers. So you kind of sometimes have to have the presence of mind to be like, well, maybe I'm not the right performer for this. I should maybe get someone else to sort of do this. And then there are unique people like Neil Young, who is technically not a great singer, but brings so much to the party as an artist interpreting his own songs. It would be difficult for a lot of other people to sing a Neil Young song. Yeah. Whereas he does it, and, and you just... you It's so believable. Right. You You know it's come from... Right. where the song emanated from. So having yeah. another singer sing your song would be a pitch where you're pitching the song and not yourself as an artist, obviously, because an artist wouldn't you know, say, well, this guy sings better than me, so I'm going to have him sing it. If, it's an art, if, it, if they're pitching themselves sort of as a band, you know, in other words. Yes, they might know. feel that way, but mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, like, I've had numerous conversations with people at these festivals where if they come across and it's like you can hear that it's a great song, they know it's a great song. Mm-hmm. So good for them that they know they wrote a great song. But it's like, you may not be as good of an artist as you think you are. Right, I see. You know, mm-hmm. and just because all your family and friends tell you you're a fantastic fantastic wow. artist doesn't necessarily mean that you really I are. I know. Unless I, you're from you know, a dysfunctional yeah. family and they say, you suck, you should give it up and go to work at the shoe <laughs> store. Right? Well, you know, that's the, that's the, 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 real quick, just to insert there, because this is a really important topic. That's kind of the idea of really knowing your strengths your we- and your weaknesses. Absolutely. And uh, I had the difficult, uh, you know, task of telling somebody in a similar situation that had really good songs and he asked me what do you think of these of these recordings and this material and I said it's great and I'm not saying that I'm a singer but it sounds like someone's choking you from behind you know (laughs) this is not good and uh, I mean and he was obviously very angry at me because I was (laughs) well you know I mean uh, he, he was a buddy, so I thought I could ah, just okay. be straight up honest. But, you know, because we don't need people to blow smoke up our butts, so to right. speak, you know. He went home for six months, uh, thought about what I had said, was really <laughs> angry. And then instead, you know, and started finding the right singers for the right, you know, for the songs. And and had them come in and demo and then just started placing stuff like left and right and came back and said, you know what, thanks for being honest. Because unfortunately, what we all do with each other is, you know, oh, dude, bro, you're the man. 
you know, it's perfect. Oh, it's great. You know, great song. And and that's not really that's not that's not helping. It's not helpful. You know, right. it's, it's not helping. Yeah. So we really need to get uh, you know unbiased feedback. And unfortunately, sometimes our friends and the people around us aren't going to give you that. You know, we should disclose that Bobby worked on our A and R team here for probably 15 years so he's quite sure. expert and as are all, all the people who do a and r here they will tell you the truth they we've they've learned how to couch it in a more digestible palatable yeah. way yeah because that speeds up the process of getting better if somebody says it sounds like you're being choked from behind <laughs> you may not listen yeah. as quickly yeah yeah yeah, as, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah it sounds good I, but yeah, i think it could be yeah. better if you did. sure absolutely right <laughs> so. and, and that's and that's the way uh you know uh, the taxi uh, approaches it very very professionally and that's normally the way i approach it too uh, and this, we don't sugarcoat this, this, this is a buddy, you know. So yeah. Uh, yeah. not anymore. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> no, he, he uh, yeah, he came to me and said, "You're right." But and I, thanks for wow. Being uh, the yeah. other, the, I know we've now drawn this off and gone on tangents, but the question initially was three key assets. I've talked oh, yeah. about yeah, two. One more. The third, I would just say, especially because we are so sync focused, is that I think the challenge with any lyric, and again, it's going back to the lyric in this case of you want a, a lyric that is as general and universal as possible with as many specifics in telling a story that are not in there because you know the more you talk about bobby and susie you know like your earlier thing the more you mention bobby and susie no one is necessarily going to want to use it because you've pigeonholed yourself right. into all these you whereas know, if you talk about they fell in love on a moonlit or not even a moonlit night yeah they, or we, they fell in love we, yeah however something I mean, everybody like, knows about look it, at the songs that we all see five million ways to sunday right you know is an american author's best day of my life i have i've had the time of my life from dirty dancing like you know i think some of the hardest songs to write is that it seems so hard to get artists and songwriters to write positive, upbeat songs with universal lyrics. Because they come it sounds from a easy point of to describe. In a lot of cases, a but lot it's, of songs it's are inspired a, by I, and I get trauma. it, and I get <laughs> yeah. it, and it's cathartic, and that's why you do this to go through that process. But yeah. but those positive, upbeat songs with universal lyrics are the ones that we're going to hear five million times in everything until we get sick of them. Yeah. You know, you know, you, we could rattle off song by song or whatever. That's Black it. Eyed Peas, you know. Don't Stop the Believing, party. Uh, Journey. Oh, totally. I mean, it talks about Small Town Girl, but that becomes insignificant because the chorus and the concept of that lyric is so big. I mean, that's got to be up there in the top 100 most sync songs in the Has history. Has to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the challenge of, you know, get finding the balance of, I don't want to say a generic lyric, but you see, again, you don't want to use a lyric that everyone else has used five million times before. You just say it in a new and a different way with as many uh, specifics as possible not Left there. Out. Yeah. With that, I want to remind everybody about the course, uh, which is coming up on April 1st. So go ahead and put uh -huh. it away. Um, it's a course called Intro to Music Publishing, a creative and business perspective. It's fully online. So if you're interested in taking the class, you go to uclaextension.edu and you would search uh, for Bobby Borg and Michael Ames. Uh, and uh, His know, name is first and much easier to Google. <laughs> so I would go for him. And uh, yeah, just I specifically said... Ames, not Eames, right? <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, and it would be it would be great to have you guys. You know, we're going to be doing uh, you know video chats every week, and uh, you know there's assignments, and you know we talk about all this kind of stuff. So and if you be, have a hard time getting cool. in, I know some actors you can call that could probably help. Oh, no. <laughs> but a boom! <laughs> I'm sorry. That's where no, you're. No, no, that's no, no, where no. I want to like press a yeah, button yeah, yeah. over here. On the there you go. Oh, oh, he's got the button too. I'm vicious today. I must have woken up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> we're having fun. Yeah, right? we are. Yeah, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, I could literally do like three, four hours straight with you guys. You're, you're a wealth of information. And anybody who doesn't watch this show is missing out because you guys know your stuff and, and you're musician friendly. You're not lofty people looking down your nose be like you people are fools because you don't know this you actually seem to give a damn and i, I really absolutely that. yeah, yeah totally. and we we're musicians first and foremost right no i mean that's why i was yeah. so thrilled when bobby asked me last year to join this thing because it was like this is his whole thing yeah. of like tank taking all these complex things and distilling it down into language that you can understand so you know that that's kind of 
he does it so well he doesn't need me but i'm happy since i live it every day and he lives all this stuff every day we make a good pair definitely yeah yeah well i i look forward to, uh, i may have to come and audit the class i i, I think years ago Many years ago, I think you had me come and speak at one of your classes. Oh, I'd think, always love to have you. I uh, think it was you. And, yeah. and I just remember going, this class is so much better than I thought it would be. Not because I thought you would do anything. <laughs> no, I didn't think he would do anything that would be what you say, Now, what are you saying? <laughs> what I'm saying is that I had so many bad teachers and professors through my entire education that I, I have a bias against the educational system. Where mm -hmm. I, I don't think teachers are relatable. I don't think they're giving students information that they can use when they walk out of the room. And, yeah, and that's you the did. most important. I walked yeah. out of there going, damn, I learned a lot of stuff tonight. I think I know everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the problem, unfortunately, sometimes with, with academics is that they, they become too academic to the point they're where They're talking to other academics. Yes. Right. And instead and you're, of their students. And you're over analyzing things where it's not necessarily practical. It's just very deep for the point of being deep. Well, but, you do it really, really well. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you both. Um, Michael Ames, Bobby Borg, um, the class again, one more time. Oh, it's called Intro to Music Publishing, <laughs> hey, Creative I, and Business Perspective. I'm not plugging it because I want to put uh, 10. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to put 10. Oh, you've already put it in? Oh, okay, oh, cool. Man, I'm, I'm that telling you, she's, our, she's the shit. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Come and take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> With that. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank we will see you guys next week. And next week is multi, 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 hundred times gold and platinum record producer Michael Lloyd will be on the show for the first time ever. Oh, see you awesome. guys then. Wow, awesome. Talk to him about time in my life. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. He produced it.